Thanks for joining me. I'm your host, Regina Brett. You want to conquer fear, shame, and doubt? You want to talk to Ramona Robinson. She grew poor number six in a brood of 11 kids in Wilson City, Missouri. Her mother was a seamstress and a single parent who maintained a small farm with chickens and rabbits running around behind the house. <laughs> Henrietta Robinson never earned enough to buy any of her children a toy, a birthday gift, or a Christmas present. They were hand-me-downs and lived in the sticks, or as some would say, on a dirt road to nowhere. But Ramona turned it into a dirt road to somewhere. That poor girl who was afraid to speak up became an eight-time Emmy Award-winning journalist, philanthropist, and entrepreneur with 30 years of public speaking experience. She's a national award-winning author of A Dirt Road to Somewhere, and Your Voice is Your Power. Ramona was a TV trailblazer, the first black female to anchor an evening broadcast in Cleveland, and to solo anchor an evening newscast in the city. She covered presidents and world leaders, including Nelson Mandela, Ronald Reagan, and Barack Obama. Ramona, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. And I have to give you the credit you deserve when you talk about my memoir, Regina. Oh, shucks. <laughs> you, I mean, you were so kind to first of all, even, even read it, because I know you were busy with your own books. Um, but I struggled, you know, with that title. And, and you, I think two or three chapters in, you said, Ramona, I've got it a dirt road to somewhere. And I was like, how could you come up with that so quickly when I had struggled for years with the title? And, and there was that line where I said that my mom said, we're raising you back here on this dirt road that leads to nowhere, but you are going somewhere. And you were like, ah! get, My head's getting goosebumps as you share that because it was sort of like that Holy Spirit moment, moment where you're just given the, the words and like I knew it between your mom making that connection and that she could see you. She could see that road going somewhere for you. And I always thought that was so powerful. My mom was, when it came to uh, education, hard work, grit, uh, stick to it uh, my mom was a master at it. I mean, she grew up with a father who she lost at 12 years old, but he owned 40 acres and with one mule, he plowed his own fields and he would just uh, not only tell my mom, but show her examples of hard work and how you could enjoy the fruits of your labor if you just put in the time. And so she grew up with that and she taught us that tenacity and, and that perseverance. And that's, that's all I've ever known is, is hard work. That's, that's for sure. I wish we could have your mom with us. I know you lost her a little while back, yeah. but we got to bring her here with us in spirit. Your mom had three loves, Jesus, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and Walter Cronkite. I don't know how that white guy fits in there, but tell us about this. That draws laughter, the most laughter, I must tell you, from all of my audiences, and I'm not quite sure why, but uh, they love hearing that. Um, my mom was a huge woman of faith, and uh, she loved the Lord, and she um, also loved, because she grew up in that time, um, you know, Jim Crow and, and, you know, just unbelievable racism in this country. And, um, and then there was Walter Cronkite, uh, the, who was considered the god of television news. She watched him every evening and hung on his every word and believed everything he said. And, and as you said, having 11 children, me being right there in the middle, uh, and being a good student, I never really got a lot of time with my mom and I craved it. And so one of the things I would do every evening, I would crawl up in her lap. She had her favorite little brown chair and I would say, can I watch the news with you? And I grew to love it. I mean, I just, I would hang on his every word. I started to mock him um, <laughs> and, and you know, his, uh, signature uh, sign out, which was, uh, I'd say, and that's the way it is, Tuesday, January 5th. And pretty good. <laughs> yes, I would change my voice, and I just loved his calm delivery, and even though there was so much going on in the world, uh, wars and riots and protests, and he just made you feel calm, like everything would be okay, and so I started try, trying to emulate him. And I love that as a little girl, you saw that that journalist could be that voice of calm in, in a crazy world. I mean, you know, when we grew up, uh, assassinations of King and Kennedys and um, yeah. Malcolm X, and the world just seems so unsafe, though, the Vietnam War. Every time you watch the news, people are dying. 
and to have Walter Cronkite be that kind of fatherly or grandfatherly figure of calm. Well, so many people in my community, and, and uh, you have to understand, um, they didn't mean any harm, but so many people said to me, oh, you can't do that. Get your head out of the clouds, you know, go to college, major in something sensible. As a matter of fact, uh, Mrs. Salone chased my mom and me down one day after church and said, uh, now, Miss Enretta, you tell that girl to get her head out of the clouds. She can't be no Walter Conkite, and she always <laughs> mispronounces it. <Tim's name. laughs> and I wanted to say, it's Walter Cronkite, but you know, <laughs> we were taught to respect your elders. You didn't talk back, but she would say, ain't no white people gonna hire her to be on those news. Like, she can't do that. And so I remember my mom looking down at me saying, well, she's getting really good grades and, and that's what she wants to do. So I've got to support her. Uh, but it was hard to believe that anyone could come from a town of 212 people, 12 being my family. Your family had made it so much of the population. We both come from big families. There are 11 in my family. I have five brothers and five know. sisters. And you're in the middle. I'm smack dab in the in middle. The middle. And I love being in the middle as far as my relationship with my siblings because I could hang with the older crowd and with the, the babies. And the best of everybody. I had the same thing, yep. yeah. So, so Ramona, you're, you're a, growing up as poor as you can get, you're a black woman who, the roles that, there were no role models at the time for black women. There are no. barely any roles for women. So how did you, coming in Missouri, you got your Missouri accent, you've got poverty surrounding you, how did you keep believing bigger than what was right in front of you? I think for me, um, my mom told me when I left home, she said, you know, you remember God will place gifts in your path, but it's up to you to recognize those gifts. And whatever you do, don't squander the gift. And um, gosh, I was met with my first gift when I went off to college. I was called into a financial aid office. Um, and I remember Mr. Charles Glasper saying to me, Ramona, I have some bad news. I don't know why or how the paper mix up, but I'm gonna have to send you home. You don't have enough money. You're $600 short on your tuition, which might not sound like a lot today, <laughs> but you know, in the eighties, that was a, probably a, like a whole money. quarter or semester. Yeah. And so um, I just started crying. Um, actually, I was bawling in the fall apart in his office. And, and I was appealing to him saying, you don't understand all my life. This was my dream. My pastor said I could. My mom said I could. My Lord and Savior said I could. And now you're going to send me home. And he said, I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do. You know, I talked to your mom. She's got four other kids in college. The bank won't loan her any more money. And she said for you to get on the next Greyhound and come home. And I just really lost it then because I said, you don't understand where I come from. There are no jobs. There is no hope. And he looked at me and said, my, my child, I've, I've had plenty of kids in here, freshmen who are crying because they want to go home, colleges is for them, and yet you're crying because you want to stay at our university. And he said, go on back to your dorm room. I'm going to find a way. And, and so he found me a job the next day, and, and the rest is history, as they say. And you earned a Bachelor of Science in uh, Broadcast Journalism from Lincoln University in Jefferson yes. City. And I credit Regina, I re credit my professors who cared whether or not I got it. You know, I don't talk about this in the book, but um, I was accepted at um, Kansas and I went there and I was terrified. Growing up in a town of 200 people, if you can imagine, there were like 25,000 kids on that campus. And I was just lost in the crowd. And I thought, this is not for me. And I tell parents this all the time, you know, don't get so caught up in sending your kids to the biggest school or an Ivy League college. Those small colleges for kids like me who didn't have a lot of money, who, um, just wanted the opportunity to get an education. My professors cared about me. They cared whether I got it. And one of the, the ones I talk about in the book, um, he said to me, he said, you know, you've got this Southeast Missouri twang and you're <laughs> never going to make it in the business <laughs> unless you I hear it. I want to hear that. Do you still have it in you? It's funny. I can still resort right back to it when I go home. 
uh, you know, instead of words like, because most of my family, even though I grew up in Missouri, they migrated from Mississippi. And so we would say things like, uh, God, open that dough. You got $40. Mama cooking some pork chops. <laughs> and, so, and so that's how I was speaking in college. And um, he was looking at me like, this is not gonna work in television news. And so I went home and worked on it, looked in the mirror, got the newspaper, and just kept pronouncing those words and practicing on, on speaking better English. Did you ever feel like you were losing some part of you as you did that? Or did your mom feel like, oh, I'm losing my little girl who's speaking my language? I, I never felt that way until I talk about going home for the first time after my voice and diction had changed and a group of girls that I went to uh, high school with, uh, they did not like it at all. You know, my sister Yvonne, who's a firecracker, she, uh, and she was always my protector, protected me from bullies and she was with me that day. And, and I remember my friends saying, you sound different. You've gone up there at that white school and you sounded like them white people. Uh, is that how they're teaching you to speak? And, you know, trying not to be condescending. I said, well, actually, I'm going to a historically black college and I'm trying to learn better English so that I'll be able to get a job. But it was the way they rolled their eyes on me. It just left me wondering, wow, you know, I'm being ragged on because I'm trying to better myself. And so some people, I, I discovered, Regina, you've just got to let them live where they are. You will never convince them of anything. And so, you know, unfortunately, in, with some people, that's what I had to do. You know, it is hard sometimes when you leave, a, a, especially a small town where everybody thinks they know you and they kind of lock you in and they see you this way. And when you change and evolve, sometimes they almost feel like it's an in, like you're you're leaving them behind, but you're also judging them when you're really just trying to build a new life. You know, I've talked to um, uh, kids over the years, some who became you know multi-million dollar athletes, and they struggle with that all the time because they grew up in some of the harshest inner cities in this country, and so when they leave and they're in this profession. Uh, and they have money and prestige and power. Mm -hmm. And when they go home, it's like uh, their friends are trying to draw them back, even those that might be involved in some illegal activity. And of course, you've got to stay away from that. And so they will use these mind tactics uh, to convince you that, oh, you've changed. Oh, we're, we're not good enough for you anymore. And it's just, no, you've you, you got to be safe and careful. Right. So you get through school, and uh, this was so powerful in your book. At 26, you were assigned to cover a KKK rally. I nearly dropped the book. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty young to be facing that. And as a journalist, you've got to maintain your composure and not be biased, which is really hard. So tell me about yeah. this rally and how that was for you. Well, when I entered the business in the mid 80s, um, there was a huge influx of women and blacks coming into uh, television news, which you know had been predominantly a male industry. You have one single male, white, anchoring the news and that was it. And so there was some resistance, some pushback to all these women who men had to move over and share the anchor desk with. And some men grabbed uh, you know, gladly allowed us to come on in, and and others uh, didn't didn't want women in that role, uh, and especially blacks in that role. And so, one of the things some of the um, employees would do would be to uh, get together and give a certain person assignments that they felt would frighten them so much that they quit. Right. And so, you know, that's kind of why I was given that assignment. And I remember my manager saying to me, um, I've got a great assignment for you, Mona. The, uh, and I'm like, oh, great. What You're is like it? excited. <laughs> I know. And she said, uh, well, the Ku Klux Klan is having a rally here in Charleston, South Carolina, and I want you to go cover it. And so I start, you know, shaking inside, <laughs> you know, my stomach is in knots. I'm like, oh my goodness. And, um, and then when I got up, she said, and before you go, the Grand Dragon will be there. And I want you to walk up to him and get me an interview. 
And of course, now I want to faint. Oh my gosh. <laughs> if I had only seen the Klan in, you know, movies or, right. or in a few right. history books. And what I did say, see, I knew I didn't want to be, you know, out there close to them. And, right. and I tell this story of how even before we arrived at the rally, blocks away, the sound was deafening. You could hear them marching in harmony, and I assume it was the uh, Grand Dragon on the bullhorn saying Blacks and Jews should be rid of the world. And, and my eyes are so big <laughs> because I, I'm thinking, this is the day my life will end because they will riot. And, and, and on one side of the street, there was a huge presence of police with you know their guns holstered and billy clubs out and on the other corner there were uh, protesters, blacks and whites, chanting, not in our town, and holding up signs, racism is wrong. And, mm -hmm. and as I got ready to get out of the, the car, uh, a wonderful white gentleman, my photographer, grabbed my hand and said, Ramona, you don't have to go out there. I know you're terrified. I'll go out there for you. I'll cover the story. I won't tell anyone you didn't do it. And, and honestly, Regina, that's when my, I had a thought of Walter Cronkite. And I said, what would he do? You know, really, I love it. Walter came to you in that moment. <laughs> <laughs> he went to uh, war-torn uh, countries to cover the news. And I'm thinking, I've got to go do this. You can do it. And I knew I carried the Lord with me. He would not let anything bad happen to me. So. You'll have to read the book to know what happened. I know you are going to have to read the book, and we're going to have a link to that on my website, reginabrett.com. Let me just pause for a moment. We're kind of at the halfway mark so quickly. I want to pause and thank all of you for listening to Little Detours with Regina Brett. And I want to thank Ramona Robinson for joining us. I know you have a lot of podcast choices, and I'm most grateful that you chose to listen to mine. Now, Ramona, there's so much, and I'm glad you wrote two books. I'm sure there are more books in you. Let's talk a little bit about you know, the idea of overcoming shame. One, you have that shame of being poor and all of the shame of the racism on top of that. But you also had moments as a woman and you share these in your book, kind of those me too moments. Oh. And it's hard to break that silence because we almost feel like it's our fault that yes. somebody be came on to us that way or behaved that way. Tell us a little bit about the moment that you felt like you had to really summon some new kind of courage. In well, it, it's interesting because when uh, a career is all you've ever dreamed about, prayed about, and you're finally there, you've worked so hard to get there, and you know, you're 21, you're 22, you, you enter the business so young, you're really still a baby, and yet you have these, you know, 40, 45-year-old men who are hitting on you constantly, basically harassing you, right. and these people have tenure at the station. They've been there forever. And in my case, uh, one of the managers um, produced the number one rated newscast in the city. So I tried to avoid his advances. I was terrified. People would say, how come you don't go to managers and tell them what's happening? You know, you're terrified because it's like, who are they gonna believe and who's gonna get fired if you make waves? Is it you, the 21 year old newbie? or the veteran who's making the station millions of dollars producing the number one newscast. And, and at least in my mind, I thought, and one of the older uh, women there, a veteran said to me, Hun, just learn to um, you know, ignore it. And she gave me some, some examples of how to, she said, when you, cause he loves to, he loved to uh, you know, touch the women's, uh, smack the women's butts. And she said, when you see him coming toward you, you know, put your body up against a wall or quickly, you know, sit down and that way he can't touch you. And so these are the things I started to try and do to avoid him touching me. And, um, you know, there have just been so, unfortunately, so many incidents, you know, today, uh, you know what I would do. <laughs> but, right. Well, you're older, but, you, you know more. Right. I'm older, I'm wiser, I'm stronger. Um, but back then it was tough. And I also, you know, talk about one of the most terrifying moments in my life uh, was when I was locked in a room and uh, one of this country's top NBA players attempted to sexually assault me. And, um, you know, I know it was God who came into that room and gave me the four words that would save me. 
but um, I've just learned so much. And thank goodness there are so many women in this country who were not saved from sexual assaults. And they live in this shame and this blame. And there are so many who don't even report it today because they don't want to be judged. Somehow it was your fault, you know, that this happened to you. And that's just absolutely not true. No woman deserves that. And I want to thank you for including that in your book, because I was assaulted as at, um, 16 and again at 21, two different athletes. And there's a sense of some entitlement to treat women terribly by some right. athletes. And when you share that, again, it felt like, oh, somebody's speaking up for me too. Mm -hmm. Anytime women speak up, they're not just speaking up for them. They're speaking up for all of us. And it's, you know, I know um, that I was saved that day um, from my perpetrator because of my, my title, my position, because he didn't know I was a, a television anchor. I, I was in Milwaukee. And um, I, I mean, I, I screamed to Jesus. I, I begged him, please get off me. Please let me go. Please don't hurt me. And he just kept saying, you know, just relax, go with it, you know, and, and nothing seemed to register until I said, I am a television anchor. And if you don't get off me, I will tell the world what you did to me. I love it. Walter Cronkite stepped in again. <laughs> gave you that voice. And well, you used your power. You you used yeah. the power that you had, Ramona. And, and it's almost like you all that prayer it finally like it took. And you yeah, had, and, uh, and you know, hence the name of my second book, Your Voice is Your Power. And uh, so you know, he he jumped up off of me because that scared him. I think he thought I was one of those, you know, round the way girls <laughs> that no one would believe who probably, you know, that, that's what he was messing with. <laughs> he didn't know who he was messing with. I, I was like, <laughs> so. I'm so glad you shared that. I really do. I, I think you free a lot of people when you share that, that shame of almost thinking, well, who's going to believe me or how can mm -hmm. this even be happening? You know, there's, that, it's hard to even believe it's happening when it's happening. It really is. And it's still happening today. My 30 year old nephew said to me uh, after he read my book, he said, you know, and it's funny, he's 30 years old and he's telling me before my book is published, Auntie, I really think you need to go deeper on this, <laughs> on this Me Too story. He said, oh, you need to arm women with some information of what to do, who to turn to, where to go. He said, because in my office, well, young women are still being sexually harassed. And I'm like, really? With all of the awareness and information out there? And he said, yes. And so I did what he said. I put more information in. And then what a great role model you've been, because your mama would have said, don't be telling your business. <laughs> oh, no. She, she, throughout your first book, she was like, we don't talk about things like that. And, and that's the thing. We learn that sometimes from our, our parents. I know um, in my church, my mom used to always say to all of us, don't you dare, I better never see you talking to that deacon and you surely better not take candy from him and sit in his lap. But she never told us why. Right. And so I grew up terrified of this man, like, oh my goodness, mama's <laughs> going to get me if she sees me talking to him. But he always had candy for us. And so we could never take it. And some of the kids did. It wasn't until I was older that I learned that he was allegedly molesting some of the church kids. And so, you know, parents are like, they want to keep things in the home. When you hear of, of nephews and uncles and cousins, you know, you right. know, perpetrating these sexual crimes against family members. I, I know growing up, a lot of times it was, you know, he's doing this, but don't tell nobody because, you know, they don't want anybody to know. And, and, and the, uh, it, it thrives on secrecy. Abuse yeah. thrives on secrecy. I want to move into this whole idea of shame. You share in your book, and again, I thank you for this, that you were not able to bear children. And so many women who have had miscarriages or who have not been able to get pregnant at all, feel this grief and also this shame as if they're somehow less than as a woman because they couldn't have children. You took a brave, bold step to share that. Tell, tell us about that. It really was tough for me. I didn't put that story in the book. I just happened to be talking to another author and somehow that came up and, and it was a man. He said, that's not in the book. 
I said, no, I can't. He said, uh, even when I think about it, I still get emotional when I cry. He was like, oh my goodness, you got to put it in the book. And oh, I know uh, why the subject came up. It was talking about how desperately I wanted children. And he said, how come you never adopted? And I said, well, I... I was raising my niece and she was my child in every sense of the way. And, you know, I talk about drug addiction. My sister was addicted to drugs and could no longer take care of her child. And she called me one day out of the blue. I mean, I am in the midst of my high powered television career, never having children. And she said, Ramona, uh, child services is going to take your niece. I need for you to take her. Just take her six months mm -hmm. and, and then I'll get myself together. I'll get clean. I promise you. Well, six months turned into four and a half years. And so I raised my niece from seven till about 11. And so that was how the conversation came up. And I said, my sister later came and just snatched her from me when she was visiting her grandmother because she feared I wouldn't give her back. And I said, it, it broke me having a child just snatched from me. I mean, I, the television had to get, the station had to give me time off. I basically curled up in a fetal position and cried, you know, 24 seven. And so he said, Ramona, you've got to write about that. And so, you know, I cried through it all, but I, I wrote about it because I wanted women to know that you're not alone. And, and Regina, I had to go through four miscarriages on television, basically, you know, going on air. I, I remember the third or fourth uh, time I lost a child. Uh, I went back to work like two days later and I'm sitting there reading these horrible stories about, you know, today a father drove his car uh, into, you know, the Mississippi River with his three children. He was upset with his mother. They all died. Or, you know, police are at a home where a woman left her children unattended. A fire happened and, and they all were killed. And, and so, really these voices would enter into my head and I know it was the enemy. I know it was Satan saying, you know, see, where is your, your Lord and Savior now? He's taken all of your babies. You can't even carry a baby. You're just inadequate as a woman. You'll never have this or that. And, and I, I started to listen. And that's what I say about, you know, stop believing those thoughts of fear. I started to, you know, my belief in the Lord and, and why this was happening. And I started to question God, well, why have you taken all of my children? Why have you had them die in the womb when you allow these people who kill their children, uh, you allow them to have children? Why not me? I want to love and nurture kids and and I struggled a great deal. And when I wrote that story, I, I still can't. When I talk to audiences about it, <laughs> I become a ball of mush and <laughs> I cry. It's so embarrassing. But um, yeah, it, it was tough to write. You know, and it's a grief that no, doesn't end. It, and you're allowed to have that grief and you're allowed to have that sadness. You know, it's, it's something that's very private. But I think that so many women go through it that People like you, when they could put it out there, people feel so less alone having gone through it. You know? I've had so many women who have come up to me and said, thank you for sharing your story. My husband and I suffered seven miscarriages. And here I was, I was thinking, you know, oh, no woman ever has suffered this many miscarriages. Maybe he's trying to tell me something. And when you hear women <laughs> say seven, nine, it's like, oh my goodness. And so I, I just think, um, one of the things that saved me um, was one of my Ramona's kids. She uh, wrote to me and said, um, Ms. Robinson, I know you've left one television station. I hope you're not going to leave the city because us kids, you know, we love you. We need you. Mm -hmm. and, and that was that moment when I realized God hadn't blessed me to have my own kids but I had my 5,000 Ramona's Kids here in Cleveland. And for people who don't know what Ramona's Kids is, it's a, it's a segment uh, and a program. I started to empower and inspire our youngsters to, to be the best of, of who they could be. And I always love that segment. And I always love seeing you surrounded by these kids. There'd be like a little mob of kids and you'd be there and... I never knew the backstory that you weren't able to give birth to children, but my goodness, the role model you became for 
so many more children and maybe you wouldn't have had time to do that or the energy or enough of your heart to go around. <laughs> so who knows? And I wonder sometimes, do you feel like that's how God answered that question for you? Exactly. That's exactly how he answered it because he knew that um, if I had children of my own, sure, I probably still would have worked with other children, but I would have been so involved in raising my own family and trying to make sure they're okay as with this crazy career that I had. I would not have time. And so I just loved um, spending time with, you know, kids here in Northeast Ohio. And the, the beauty of it is I could enjoy them, have fun, and you know, try and uplift them. And at the end of the day, I could send them back to mom. And dad. <laughs> Not like a grandparent, but yeah, like dozens of kids. Yes, so you know, it, was, it was a wonderful thing. Uh, we just have a couple of minutes. You talk a lot about God in your book. And, and I love that you don't hide your faith because sometimes people are like, oh God, they roll their eyes. They used to roll their eyes at me in the newsroom like, oh, she has a degree in religious studies, get away. You know, like it's just some people are uncomfortable with God. But you talk in your book about how do you know it's the voice of God when you've got to make a decision, when you have something that you're just not sure, how do you pray and really know that it's God speaking and not just what you want, telling you what you want? Well, yeah, people ask me that a lot, but um, I think one of the most defining moments for me in my life um, was, and, and my favorite scripture um, came out of that was, when I was fired from my television job and I couldn't get another job. I had very little savings and I didn't know what I was gonna do when or if I'd get another job. And so I had a lot of time alone and I would just cry and pray and read scripture and I wouldn't hear from God. Before that, you know, I talked to the Lord and he would answer me and, you know, not like we're talking, but, yeah. um, and, and all of a su sudden, nothing. God w wasn't speaking to me. And I was like, You're, you've left me here all alone. I have nothing. I don't know what I'm going to do. And, and a scripture I came upon was Hebrews 11.1, uh, 1, which says, you know, faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you cannot see. And so I couldn't see um, what God was doing. He was working in the background. I was going to be okay. So I needed to just have faith in him. And once I started to do that, it's, it's amazing. I call it a miracle, but going from no jobs to three job offers in one day in Des Moines, Iowa, Philadelphia, Cleveland. And, and so that's how I arrived in Cleveland. And the Cleveland job, I'd, I'd make history and, and become the first black primetime evening anchor uh, female in the city. And that's what I had always wanted, that primetime evening job. So I am a testament that you just hold on. You stay prayerful, you keep the faith, and you have to believe the word. A lot of people read the word, but you've got to believe the word. Believe God will deliver you because he will. And you know, Ramona, as you're talking, I imagine little kids all over Cleveland watching you on the news saying, I want to be like her. You're like their Walter Cronkite. You know, you're the woman they want to be. You're the voice they want to be. So thank you for all of the journey that you were on, all the hard moments that you kept at it and you didn't give up. You didn't give up for all those people out there that are going to follow you. Well, that's my, that's my second act now that I've left television. It's just to testify about the glory of God and when you love and, and accept him and give your life to Christ amazing things can happen and I'm just I'm enjoying the journey well I hope that uh, people find your book a dirt road to somewhere and your voice is your power I want to thank you for joining us and tell us again your website and how to find you on social media my website is RomonaRobinson.com, and I stress ro because um, most people spell it R-A, and uh, if you do that, you'll get a psychic. I don't think that's what you want. There's a psychic. Oh, Ramona with an O. <laughs> but you have to spell it R-O-M-O-N-A, RomonaRobinson.com, and you can now uh, learn all about me. Okay, and you also have uh, Facebook, a way to reach on Facebook. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, everywhere. Twitter, everywhere. Right, and, I'll, and I'll have links to those on my website uh, at reginabrett.com. You know, my biggest takeaway today was when you said, don't squander the gift. Yeah. All of us have a gift. 
don't squander it. I want to close with your answer to this question. Ramona, what's the best thing you do for yourself every day to create a life you love out of the life you have? Well, um, it's pretty simplistic. I wake up every morning just grateful, saying, thank you, Lord Jesus, first of all, for, for waking me up this morning. And I'll read my scripture um, and make sure I fully understand it. You know, you know, as a journalist, we need to understand what we're reading. And, and so sometimes the Bible can be a little complicated and you know you have your own interpretation but you want to you want to know what those scriptures mean and try to apply it to your own life and after my scripture you know I'll grab a cup of coffee because I can't get started without it but for me the simplest things in life people think you know television people like me we live this fabulous glorious life where we're always flying off to exotic places and staying in uh, five-star hotels but for me, just going outside, sitting, having coffee, you know, listening to Mother Nature, the birds chirping and watching little <laughs> rodents run around, you know, squirrels climb trees, you know, that's life for me. And just having gratitude for it all, that's, that's what I find that's beautiful. And knowing and trying to come up with new ways that, that I can serve other people, God's people. Because I know that when it's my time, he's not gonna care about you know how big my house was, how many cars I had. <laughs> he's gonna wanna know, what did you do for his people? Oh, that's beautiful, well, you've done a lot. And I wanna thank you so much for making this part of what you did for your people. Thank, thank you for joining us.